Welcome back, everybody, and uh, thank you for coming back. Um, we're looking forward to this next session, and I'd first like to introduce Dr. Um, Matsubara, who is a professor in the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Scientists here at UBC, and she's trained in neurosciences with an emphasis on visual systems and pathways in the brain, and her research for the last decade has been the, in the basic and translational studies of retinal disease and their treatments, and she is the lead for the vision cluster, and she's going to tell us a little bit more. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Anita. And um, thanks everyone to, uh, by giving me this um, opportunity to tell you a little bit about our cluster. I'm just gonna share screen and stop my video. Um, so hopefully, and then I'll play this from the start. Hopefully, can you see my screen? Yes. Um, great. Yeah, so I, uh, um, so we have a, a UBC Research Excellent Cluster in Vision. We're very proud of it. We started as an emerging uh, cluster in 2022. So we're just coming up to our two years. And the title of our cluster is uh, pretty much all things vision. So we cover vision from the molecules to the behavior and to society. So that's, that's a lot. Um, and I'm just going to see if I can, oh, how do I, oh yeah, down here. Okay. So, um, so just very briefly, you know, um, our mission statement is to um, pretty much um, create brand new technologies um, that we can then use to understand both the eye and the brain um, and their function in, in health and disease. Um, and everyone um, should understand, I'm pretty sure you all understand that the eye is just the peripheral organ and we actually see and perceive things through our brain and the brain pathways. Um, another um, area of our uh, cluster goes into uh, the biological and the psychophysical basis of how we see and perceive the world around us. And also we really want to take it full circle and get back into uh, the communities and explore how um, individuals with full vision or partial vision or um, blindness um, are affected and how they how they behave and how they're able to interact and participate in society. Um, so here's a little schematic where um, you know kind of gives the 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 idea behind our cluster. So we have a bunch of vision experts in this box on the left. Um, so you know we're just giving some examples, but our vision experts in our cluster study uh, different parts of the eye. Could be the retina, could be the cornea. Um, a lot of our vision experts study the central nervous system pathways. Um, some of our vision experts study and uh, design ophthalmic imaging devices. Um, we're very interested in eye movements and uh, the role of the brain and perception. Um, a group of our scientists also look at um, various synthetic tissue substitutes for eye, eye tissues. So as an example, stem cells for retinal degenerations, as an example, or um, uh, different types of hydrogels for a cornea replacement therapy. Um, so that's our vision. And then what we then did was we <clears throat> gathered um, a bunch of our colleagues who are technical experts in these areas. So artificial intelligence is one of them. That's the subject of the, the, today's um, seminars, uh, proteomics and microscopy, biological and chemical engineering, um, telemedicine, indigenous studies, and um, both um, brain neurodegenerations as well as neurological clinical care. Uh, so we, we sit around, we have lots of different virtual um, and in-person um, discussions and seminars, and the whole objective is for us to kind of shake ourselves up uh, and make new, new networks and new um, New collaborations that I think um, you know will will move us forward into um, the next decade or so for um, understanding and and trying to pinpoint and make devices that we can use to study the vision and the visual pathways as well as to understand um, how we perceive and also um, how we can improve um, an individual's uh, ability to see. So on the bottom, then we again the collaborations uh, take different formats. Um, and um, we are basic scientists or foundational studies. We also do translational. We have ophthalmologists and neurologists on um, in our in our cluster, and we also have a lot of community members. Um, so a little bit about us. Then um, uh, on the left we have um, to date twenty six faculty members, 
We have uh, about 26 trainees at all levels. We have uh, seven research staff and affiliate members and uh, two administrators. And so um, these are some pictures on our website of the individuals who are in, um, in our cluster who have helped us uh, make our networking and to make our collaborations go. And uh, the names of our people are, are here in different colors. So the foundational researchers are here in red. You can see some people's names. And our technical experts are here in blue. You can see some of the people's names here. Um, I'd point out EPEX talking later today, as well as he owned M. And then finally, uh, in purple, we have our ophthalmologists um, who help us translate a lot of our studies. And on the bottom in black, we have our community partners. Um, so that's uh, us in a nutshell. Um, we have a website, as um, every vision cluster has, I, I guess, at EBC. Uh, and we're on Twitter or X. And uh, Dr. Ren Lai is our grants facilitator, and that's her email address. Uh, feel free to contact us and join. Um, and um, if there's if there's anything that we can do to help further, uh, please let us know. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Matsuvara, for a great introduction overview of the vision cluster. So this next uh, panel, uh, we're really looking forward to hearing the talks. Our first speaker is Dr. Epeka Rook, and uh, she's the director of the NOVA Lab and an associate professor in the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences here at UBC. And her program is focused on the development and application of data science techniques in the analysis of retinal imaging, neuroimaging, and behavioral data with the goal of advancing vision science and its application in medicine. Uh, she serves on the editorial board of Vision Research. She's affiliated with several institutes at UBC, including the D David uh, Mofa, sorry, Moa, Moa Fakian. I never say this name right. I feel terrible about that. Sorry. Um, the Center for Brain Health and the Data Science Institute, as well as the graduate program of neuroscience. So you can pull up your slides and we look forward to hearing your presentation. We can't hear you yet. I think you're muted still. Oh, there Hello? you go. Yes, now you're there. Thank you so much, um, Anita, for that lovely introduction. Um, can you see my slides? Great. Um, so it's wonderful to be um, invited to this conference, the DASH conference on medicine in AI. It's also lovely to be part of this very um, interesting session um, I just want to start by saying I'm going to have to go right after my talk because of parental duties. And it, I'm very interested in the next two talks by Dr. Hyun Im and uh, Miguel Shah. Uh, I would like to watch um, if recording is available later on. So um, today I would like to talk to you about harnessing AI to accelerate scientific discovery and talk about a proof of concept study in search of novel um, retinal biomarkers. Um, so quick outline of my um, talk. Um, first, I'd like to describe two um, different approaches to the use of AI in science today. And then I'd like to do an overview of my group's research efforts to harness AI for medical research. Then I will um, do a little summary of a, re a paper we recently published. It's a proof of concept study. Um, this is where we introduce and validate a methodology for um, retinal biomarker discovery using AI. As well, this paper serves as at least aims to advance explainable AI by grounding it in empirical science principles. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about what potential future applications of this proof of concept um, methodology in medical image analysis, specifically retinal analysis. So um, Currently, there are two main approaches to the use of AI in science. On the left here is the more conventional, the more kind of ubiquitous um, way of using um, AI um, in automating tasks that are conventionally um, done by human experts. As um, abilities of AI in variety of um, um, tasks, reach human performance or even surpass human performance, we would like to kind of teach those jobs to AI and um, leave humans free um, from those tasks. For example, we know that um, 
um, CNN models, for example, uh, um, can carry out face identification tasks very successfully. So we might use an automated um, AI-based um, system in an airport, for example, to screen for faces. Um, another example is the large generative language models, such as the famous ChatGPT to summarize, translate, or create original text, which is um, normally considered to be a human activity. Um, in medicine, specifically in ophthalmology, a, a success story of this type of use of AI was seen in automated diagnosis and detection of um, ocular diseases, for example, diabetic retinopathy based on um, retinal images, for example, retinal fundus images. So a, a different approach to using AI in science, which is also the kind of approach that my group is adopting, um, is harnessing AI, not to automate a, a particular task, but to um, facilitate and accelerate scientific discovery. So there are, um, although this approach is kind of new, it is, in my opinion, gaining in popularity quite um, fast. So some very um, recent developments that um, caught my eye, for example, Simons Institute um, um, announced this polymathic AI initiative just last month. Um, it is an international collaboration between a variety of universities such as NYU, Cambridge University, Princeton, and others to build an AI powered tool that's based on the capabilities of ChatGPT, but that takes in data from multiple sciences, such as physics, chemistry, um, genomics, and so on, to in fact, um, speed up experiments and uh, make, um, make connections between different disciplines and um, um, to be used in scientific discovery across a variety of fields, going from neuroscience to um, astrophysics. Um, another example is um, right here from Canada, from University of Toronto, um, the concept of self-driving labs by the Asperu Kusik group. And this um, group aims to accelerate discovery of new materials and chemicals uh, by combining machine learning and robotics. So the, the, my talk or, or our current efforts to use AI um, is based on this kind of approach, this new um, type of approach. Um, so this proof of concept study that we just published um, recently, and, and this is, I, I'd like to walk you through this a little bit, and it's entitled Artificial Intelligence Explainability and the Scientific Method, a proof of concept study on novel retinal biomarker discovery in which um, we used um, retinal fundus images and we trained um, retinal fundus images to um, a, a, a deep conv convolutional um, neural network. So first off, um, for those of you who may not be familiar, what is a retinal fundus image? This is essentially a specialized type of photography taken through the pupil, and it gives us a good view of various ocular structures, such as the um, optic nerve head, the vasculature in the retina and the fovea, and so on. Um, and the ophthalmologist can see a variety of clinical features or pathologies related to different ocular diseases, such as hard exudates, um, cut and wool spots, microaneurysms, hemorrhages, and so on. And these features that they identify will help them diagnose as well as monitor um, disease progression, especially for diseases like diabetic retinopathy. Um, so despite the, the variety of structures and pathologies that they, the ophthalmologists can recognize in a retinal image, one thing that they cannot recognize is the patient sex. So for example, through anecdotal conversations with our colleagues, if um, we show a, a, a retinal fundus image like so to an ophthalmologist and ask them, do you think this is, comes from a male patient or a female patient? They say, I, I honestly do not know. So first off, in order to um, confirm that this is indeed the case, we developed a two alternative force choice psychophysical paradigm in which um, in each trial, the, the participant is shown one male and one female um, eye on the same screen. It's randomly either on the left or the right and the participant responds by saying left or right to pick the male eye. Um, so you can imagine if there is no knowledge or there is no information the ophthalmologist can gather from the retinal image that um, helps them even um, 
do a little bit of an educated guess, then this would be result in a performance of 50-50. So here are the results of that psychophysical study. On the y-axis, we have accuracy, and we recruited 26 ophthalmologists. And as you can see, their overall performance was 51.62% not significantly different than chance level, and also not significantly different than the performance of a non-expert group who were not familiar with um, retinal images at all, or they weren't clinicians. Now, we decided that maybe, can we try training our ophthalmologists to be able to recognize um, the features that differ between males and females? So we showed them these illustrations. We said, please pay attention to this area, the peripapillary area, it tends to be darker in males. So whenever you view a, a fundus image, pay attention to this area. We also told them that there are vascular differences, specifically um, vessels are longer in males, They're, they have more branches and more nodes, and we showed them illustration of this type. And finally, we told them to please pay attention, especially to the superior temporal quadrant, um, to say that the vessel density is greater in males, especially in this quadrant. Uh, after this descriptive training using illustrations, just like I showed you, we also gave them a chance to practice their learning um, through a 50 trial, two alternative force choice paradigm. This time we gave them feedback. So when, when they gave an answer, they knew in response whether their um, answer was correct or incorrect. Overall, this entire training took about a 50, minute period. So here are the post-training results on the ophthalmologist side. As you can see, all of them, there was a very consistent increase in their ability to discriminate females from males. D prime was 2.64. It's quite a large effect and highly significant. So pre versus post-training um, performance improves quite um, spectacularly. Same thing for the non-expert group. Now, I am sure at this point in time, you're asking, you know, if ophthalmologists and experts didn't know what the sex differences in the retina are, how did you know? Where did you come up with these sex differences? And this is indeed the topic of our proof of concept study um, we just published. So this study is composed of four phases. In phase one, we call that a CNN development. We train a convolutional neural network. I apologize for my coffee machine. It's making a little sound there. Uh, we train a convolutional ne neural network by feeding in a large number of retinal fundus images labeled for female and male and let um, the AI's ability to teach itself um, certain tasks and until um, we reached an acceptable performance. In phase two, we call this call, uh, phase inspiration. We use um, visualizations based on post hoc interpretation tools, including attention maps such as GradCam algorithm and feature visualizations such as activation maximization. So normally AI explainability depends too much on these types of tools where we look at, you know, where the, which parts of the image were critical in um, getting the AI to make those correct decisions. And those images, those visualizations uh, carry a big weight in explainable AI. In this phase, instead of doing that, we simply um, viewed a large number of visualizations and just use them as inspiration. You can think of this as, you know, in natural sciences, we make observations in nature. In this kind of science, we make observations in um, um, post-hoc interpretation visualizations. So in phase three, we call this exploration. We articulate a number of testable hypotheses and test these on an independent data set we call an exploration data set. And finally, in phase four, we call this verification. We retest all the positive results from the exploration um, stage and the positive results from phase four become our discoveries. So just a quick um, overview of how um, our study carried out these four phases. We already knew um, that CNNs, in fact, can discriminate between males and females very successfully. The first um, publication um, was by Google and they used just under 1.8 million images and their model um, trained on sex differences could do this task very, very successfully. It's a 
97% AUC. And this result was repeated by several groups, including our group in a previous study using a very small data set. And we reached an AUC of 72% with a very, very small data set. This um, shows that even though these differences are not necessarily visible or noticed by the experts, they are there. The information to make this discrimination is there and is being identified by the AI. So in our phase one, then um, we developed such as CNN and we reached a um, performance around 66% AUC and 73% test testing AUC. In phase two, we generated visualizations, um, a GradCam um, visualizations, these are the attention maps, showed us um, over and over again, over images that the vasculature is important in this decision and the optic disc, as well with feature, visual, feature visualizations using activation maximization, showed us that the optic disc is somehow more prominent in males and the vasculature is more prominent in males. So in phase three, we consolidated these observations into teams and then we articulated 14 exploratory hypotheses. These involving the size of the optic disc, brightness of the optic disc, vessel density length and branching and so on. And using the exploration data set, we found that nine of these 14 hypotheses yielded significant results in the expected direction. So in phase four verification, we took um, yet another data set and retested the positive results, which um, produced five in or replicated five of the positive um, findings, the peripapillary area brightness, vessel coverage in superior temporal quadrant, and number of nodes, branches, and total length of uh, vessels in, in males, all um, greater. So those were our discoveries. Just a quick um, technical note uh, for any of the any, any of you are wondering, the very, very crucial aspect of this work is to keep all of the data sets disjoint and mutually exclusive. So to train, to validate, to test the data to CNN, we need different um, sets as well for our exploration data set and the verification data set, they all need to be separate and independent. So just to summarize, um, we have introduced and validated a methodology to discover retinal features signaling pa patient sex by harnessing the power of AI. We were able to successfully train experts, uh, ophthalmologists, to recognize these um, new features to identify sex. They did it in a fundus image, but presumably they can do so in, a, in an eye exam. Um, we have shown that AI explainability can be elevated to attain scientific status if it is grounded in principles of empirical science, which we did in the exploration and verification stages. And future work, we aim to focus on um, going beyond the ocular diseases, for example, um, detecting whether there are signs of other diseases, systemic disease or neurodegenerative diseases in the eye, as well as sex differences in the presentation of ocular um, diseases um, going forward. Um, this work was done in collaboration with a very interdisciplinary group of colleagues. Um, here they are, some past, current, as well as some future colleagues. I would like to thank all of them, as well as our um, funding sources. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Oreck. I don't know if you have time for any questions, if anyone in the audience wishes to uh, Absolutely. Uh, put, it, put it in the chat or... Absolutely. Or... I did, I recall reading those initial studies in 2017 and 2016 in JAMA. Feels like a lifetime ago when uh, all of the, the convoluted neural networks and trying to understand that. So I I find it fascinating that the steps that you outline. Can, can I ask a question? Where did you get all of your data sets with the retinal imaging? Were they all local or were they like, where do you obtain like all these separate data sets and right? Um, so for this particular study that um, I, I, I presented, there were two sources. One of them is local. So coming from a B BCH source, our department has its own imaging department that um, I have access to. So we have been curating our own data 
since um, I believe 2017. It's an incredibly slow process. So yes. that, that's why most of my data sets are very small. The other one um, was an, a public, it's called the ODIR data set from um, China, collected from a variety of hospitals, different hospitals um, through China. And that is not a very large data set either. So currently my source is a, a, a private data set called IPAX. I didn't present any data of that here, but going forward, mm -hmm. um, that allows me to go one step up, you know, going to 10,000, you know, wow. 50,000 yeah. kind of images um, that are better matched for our future purposes. So, so data is a little bit of a bottleneck as everybody kind of appreciates, yes. I believe. So we have done one aspect of, of this work is we have shown, you know, even with small data, you can achieve certain results. For example, our results are about 70% mm -hmm. AUC with the AI, but our humans are achieving that level as well. So even if you can't achieve a hundred percent, it seems that we have extracted all the info that the AI was using and translated to our ophthalmologists that it's interesting to me that AI and the ophthalmologist performance were not hundred percent, but they were similar right. to each other. Um, but the, nevertheless, there are some still advantages to using a larger data, especially by being able to match more precisely for age, ethnicity, and other kind of clinical um, disorders and things of this nature with very small data sets, that is not really that possible. You don't have the full spectrum. Yeah. Because yeah. once you start matching, you exclude a lot of data sets. Right. If your entire data is 5,000 images, then there isn't a whole you know, space for you to exclude images. Right. Well, thank, thank you so much your presentation. You're very welcome. There's one question for future research. What strategies are you going to uh, link the retinal image with neurodegenerative disorders? Are you going to database and the administrative data? So same. Uh, thank you so much, um, Yuki. Um, so same question. So it is not that there aren't any retinal images available out there. The whole issue is the labeling of it. So with the neurodegenerative disorders, the big bottleneck is that the reason people don't get an eye image taken because they were seen by a neurologist, right? So those two dis disorders, the imaging and the disorder itself don't go together. And therefore in many kind of um, retinal databases, we don't actually get a, a reliable label for whether a person has a neurodegenerative disease or not. What makes this very promising is that retina is considered to be a piece of the brain. And in a way, a fundus image gives you a very non-invasive low cost view of a piece of the brain, a living tissue of a living neural tissue. So there is a, a, a big promise there, um, but um, I, I, I do not have a database in mind at the moment. I'm, um, I'm in talks with neurologist colleagues from the MCVH to see whether you know it would be feasible to put together maybe even image actual local people and connect it with proper um, diagnostic labels. But good I question. think it's a fabulous opportunity if that is something that you could do. Yeah, I think with lots of expertise. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anita. So uh, just welcome everyone to put uh, their questions into the chat and um, or raise your hand. Um, there's one more question, and then we're going to have to move on. It's, can AI be used in other imaging modalities of the eye, such as OCT? Um, absolutely. And in fact, it, I believe it can be used in any kind of imaging modality. Um, the CNN is especially powerful with images. So these visualization techniques are especially informative when we talk about images. So definitely OCT and definitely other types of medical images as well. Thank you so much. Thank so you. it is my uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. He Yan Im, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at the Director of the Interactive Mind and Movement Laboratory at UBC. Um, her team investigates how different parts of the brain coordinates countless connections between perception and action to mediate safe and timely motor movements in various physical and social contexts. She's also interested in neurocognitive biases of deficient perception action links and impaired visuomotor coordination skills or maladaptive social behaviors. 
often a hallmark of many emotional disorders. So we greatly look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Angela, for the nice introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you see my screen, Will? Yes. Okay, good, good. Yeah, so I'm so honored to be part of this uh, conference. Uh, so today I'll be presenting two new research projects, and I'll start by talking about our data. So we use human brain recording, particularly data collected from neuroimaging devices. And one is called functional MRI, and the other is called MEG. So fMRI or functional MRI measures the small changes in blood flow that occur with uh, the brain activity. So it provides pretty accurate pictures of the brain activities so we can know where the neural activity occurs. In other words, it has a good special resolution. So we obtain time courses of brain activity happening in each voxel and a voxel is actually a uh, 3D pixel that makes up the entire brain. So with our scanning parameters, the raw fMRI data typically gives us time series of uh, 100,000 voxels. And the MEG is a non-invasive, completely silent and safe neuroimaging device that measures the time course of a magnetic field uh, that changes as a result of neural activities in the brain. So this device has excellent tem temporal resolution or precision, allowing us to look at temporal changes occurring in sub milliseconds. So which is roughly similar to the actual information processing speed of the brain. So there are 306 very sensitive MEG channels we uh, record with, and we obtain 360 sets of time courses recorded at every millisecond. And by combining high resolution 3D pictures of the brain uh, structure taken with MRI, we can actually overlay such uh, uh, MEG time courses uh, onto the brain surface to ask questions on brain activation uh, patterns over time and over space. So I'm not sure if the animation works, but actually the, you, you can see the neural signals actually traveling of, across different regions of the brain over time using the MEG combined with the structural MRI. So I'll present today one fMRI and one MEG project uh, using similar, uh, very simple machine learning algorithm today. And both are very, very new, and they only began a uh, year or two ago, years ago. So um, in both projects, we obtain time course data from humans, human brains, and use a very simple form of a machine learning algorithm for now to better understand and describe what's happening in different regions of the brain at different time uh, points. So. Um, our hope is that uh, this approach can be developed and refined so we can actually uh, use machine learning algorithm uh, in the brain data under two different themes. So the first project is more in the first theme, which is understanding and characterizing the brain's wiring patterns. So uh, I'm going to introduce uh, a briefly a project on the children's brain wiring patterns uh, who have behavioral and cognitive de deficits, uh, hoping that uh, our method can be uh, informative for future diagnosis and assessment using uh, much more advanced uh, AI mechanisms, algorithms. And the second theme is uh, predicting and decoding internal states of the brain or mind. So I will present some data sets from our study that uh, looked at the speech sound perception in young children by using the MEG. Uh, so here is the first project I will just overview today on how we can use the machine learning algorithm to understand the brain's wiring patterns. So uh, I work with these coll wonderful collaborators and then and trainees um, uh, in this fMRI study. So here our motivation is that there is uh, empirical evidence that uh, suggests there are some common behavioral deficits reported in many different neurodevelopmental disorders, including dyslexia, amblyopia, autism, and so on. So these uh, Common deficits include eye movement, motion perception, motor function, reading, and face perception. Although their clinical presentations are very different, it seems that there are some common uh, impairments that are not functioning uh, typically in these uh, children with neurodevelopmental, uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. 
So we wanted to actually use a machine learning algorithm to better understand and kind of map out the common and unique wiring patterns in these developing brains by asking whether they have some similar or unique patterns of alterations in the brain's functional connectivity. So in our first attempt, we used and tested three different uh, groups, including a group of children with dyslexia and one group with uh, amblyopia, also known as the AZI in more, uh, in more common words and the control uh, of participants, which is a group of children with typical development. Here, uh, what, we did, what we did is um, we measured uh, eight-minute resting state functional MRI while our participant, the children, was uh, lying on the bed uh, attached to the scanner with their eyes closed. And using this data, by combining them to with the structural MRI, we actually could get some time courses extracted from different parts of the brain. And then we created um, correlation matrices uh, by computing the pairwise correlations between all among all these parts of the brain. So we call this functional connectivity matrix. And using this functional connectivity matrix, we uh, trained our model and try to um, um, classify different participants into one of the three groups we tested. So we used a very simple uh, machine learning algorithm, um, which is called support vector machine. Uh, so we trained our uh, support vector machine on the data set. We collected from three groups without any uh, uh, by, uh, by excluding one data set from them. And then uh, after the training, uh, the model was asked to predict uh, which specific data set would be classified into one of the three groups. So it's n minus one data set for the training and just one data set for classification test. Uh, so we were asking whether uh, there's any specific pattern that are specific to each of the groups, control, dyslexia, and amblyopia, so that that information can be available for the model to use and to make uh, accurate prediction about which participant belongs to which group, only based on the whole brain resting state connectivity patterns. So we did this procedure uh, by randomly shuffling the data uh, in uh, 100 uh, iterations. So if the SVM, the support, support vector machine, gives a good classification accuracy from the test session after training, that would mean that there's some useful featural information based on differences in the pattern of FC matrices across the three groups. So, uh, and that would also mean that SVM can use that information to make a accurate prediction about the membership of each mat uh, FC matrix given for the test. So here is what we got as performance of the SVM classification. So the SVM could predict uh, which participant belongs to which group quite accurately, and that suggests that there are some differences across the groups that can be used for the model, and also there are some feature similarities within each group so that the model can pre uh, precisely accurate uh, the patterns of the brain uh, to classify each participant into the three groups, possible groups we tested. And then we asked a further question using this SVM accuracy matrices and prediction accuracy by, ask, uh, by using the searchlight approach here. So basically, this is an approach where we can go search uh, each voxel to find out which area or which part of the brain uh, could have given the best prediction accuracy for the SVM. So we actually found uh, each voxel by classifying the, the participants into the three groups separately and then compare the classification accuracy by creating a whole brain classification accuracy map like this. And we found out some of the clusters that give uh, the highest scores. So these are some parts of the regions and the regions that I we identified might be less relevant to audiences in this conference Are a part of candidate brain regions that have been traditionally suggested to be involved in some of the behavioral function uh, reported to be uh, impaired in these you know, uh, neurodevelopmental disorder uh, groups. 
So, um, so although it's still in early stage, this set of results at least suggest that there are some brain parts that contribute more to the good classification accuracy of SVM than others. And that also suggests that there are some candidates of the brain regions that might have some distinctive features uh, that can be used for classifying different neurodevelopmental disorder groups. Uh, yeah, so using the data-driven method, we could suggest uh, disorder-specific patterns in whole brain functional connectivity uh, by using very simple machine learning algorithm here. And this can be informative, uh, hopefully, for assessing the whole brain's wiring patterns and determining specific brain regions to look deeper. And uh, finally, uh, we know that it's be much better with more subgroups of neurodevelopmental disorders. So we'll be uh, uh, a lot, uh, very much welcome to any opportunities for collaboration or data sharing for this project. Uh, and in the second project, uh, I'm working on uh, with my collaborators and trainees here uses MEG uh, and applies a similar machine learning algorithm to decode the unfolding of brain activity patterns with high temporal resolution and predict which speech sound a child heard only based on the MEG time course. So we hope that this can be um, applications for diagnostic and clinical tools to assist children with abnormalities of uh, speech acquisition, like um, those who have speech or language disorders. So here, uh, for uh, making practical decoders, we actually focus on two things. And first of all, the decoder, the speech decoder, should have a high accuracy with a minimum number of repetitions, and it should have a specificity to meaningful speech sounds, but no sensitivity to irrelevant but speech-like sounds. For example, uh, the model should be sensitive enough to English uh, speech sounds for English speaker, but uh, not Japanese phonemes for those English speakers, because speech sounds are only specific to their language that they, they are using. So for this attempt, we used uh, Japanese phonemes and tested children from Japanese speaking and English speaking families so that the model can selectively help decoding of the speech perception only in children who are speaking Japanese language, but not in English speakers. So we measured MEG time courses at every millisecond from 306 sensors covering the whole brain of young children under uh, five years old age. And uh, the first five participants were tested in Boston Children's Hospital while I was there as a postdoc using a customized pediatric MEG scanner that has a smaller body and helmet. And while a child is lying on the bed attached to the MEG scanner, we, we play separate sound uh, stimulus, which was one of the Japanese phoneme sounds like this. And we had 55 repetitions for each sound. And here are some examples of MEG data. You can see at least um, at around 100 milliseconds after the sound is played, there are some changes in neural activity patterns that potentially differ by particular sounds presented. So such MEG time courses are overlaid onto each children, a child's uh, brain surface model and then um, extracted different time sources, uh, courses from some of the re regions like this in the temporal loop that are known as a part of the brain's language network. And here again, we use a simple and pairwise support vector machine, and we got the algorithm trained on one set of the data and then tested for its classification accuracy using the other set of the data. And we also varied the number of the training and the test sets to find out how many repetitions we would need at minimum to make our experiment short enough, but still maintaining good enough classification accuracy. And what's good thing about this approach is that we can actually uh, segment our data sets and accuracy for the prediction by the regions of the interest. So you can see different parts of the brain give us a different prediction accuracies and also by using different time windows so that we can actually see how the speech sound is represented and resolved over time in the brain. And we also found that um, 
uh, our initial version of the model could discriminate 10 uh, different Japanese phoneme sounds only in Japanese speaking child uh, with pretty good accuracy. So with 35 trials or repetitions, the, the model could actually discriminate all these 10 phonemes almost at 100% accuracy. Although uh, reducing the trial numbers to five would um, uh, drop the, the accuracy onto the chance level around 50%. And our next version we are working on includes all 46 phonemes using multi-class classification instead of pairwise. And also here we are more than, you know, we're very, very excited to any future opportunity for collaborations. If you have, you know, better models and more advanced AI models, then we can apply to this data set. Okay, so to wrap up my presentation on uh on this, uh, the second project I showed you today, uh, our model hopefully can provide informative tools to assess and assist children with speech acquisition, perception, and production problems, uh, solving such such uh, such as um, quasi real time speech decoder. And I just want to note that uh, we are using a similar approach. Uh, uh, utilizing the SBM for our new project uh, to decode hand movements and motor imagery uh, to have some clinical implications for motor rehabilitation after injuries or surgeries, which is a project by uh, my new postdoc, uh, Minsu, who, has, who is an expert on this uh, uh, human, uh, human brain and computer interaction system. So as you can see, uh, such simple approach can be applied to many different modalities and many different brain and behavioral functions. Okay, so to, to conclude, uh, hopefully I presented some examples uh, that we are very excited about, although still on the horizon, to be honest with you, on how AI can be used in the future of the pediatric neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience studies and their clinical applications. So to summarize my points, uh, the AI can understand and improve brain and behavioral function if we uh, neuroscience researchers can decipher brain signals with good spatial and temporal resolution. And this hopefully can provide potential tools for diagnosis and assessment through data-driven approaches without having to uh, find prior knowledge or assumptions of where in the brain we have to look at. And finally, the development in uh, AI techniques and applications can inform um, the robotic devices to assist perceptual and cognitive and behavioral impairments. So with that, I'd like to thank you uh, and uh, thank my collaborators and trainees and my funding sources. Thank you so much for a, a very, very interesting presentation. I think we have time for one question. Um, is there anyone in the audience? So one question I had for you, I was struck by the smaller sample size yes. compared to what the previous uh, Dr. Rook was presenting. So I just wanted you to, because I thought with the, any machine learning, you needed a large data set. So I just wanted you, I think, to speak to that. Thank you. Sure, sure. So thanks for the question. So that's why I'm saying it's very early stage. We are still collecting the data, which will take a lot of time. So which, I mean, each scan takes about three hours, right? So it's a very okay. slow process to get all this, all this data, but each subject will give us lots of data points. Right. So yeah, so it's not like one single, you know, 2D or 3D image. It's going to be like reach uh, like thousands, uh, hundred thousands of voxels over time that mm -hmm. we are actually uh, working on. But still, we need a lot more subjects for sure. And that's why we are trying to use very simple form of the machine learning algorithm rather than using mm -hmm. like a small something like a fancy that IPEC could use for now, right? Yeah, so that's, but still we are looking for uh, looking forward to collecting more data, yeah. It was very rich, it's very fascinating, the imaging. Yes, thank you. thank you. So we'll have you, you're gonna be able to stay to be part of the panel so others may come up with some questions that we could ask you at that time. So it is my pleasure for our next speaker, uh, Dr. Nigam Shah, you can put up your presentation as I introduce you, hello. Um, he, he's a professor of medicine at Stanford University and the chief data scientist for Stanford Healthcare. His group analyzes electronic health data claims, wearables, web logs, and patient blogs to answer clinical questions, generate insights, and build predictive models for a learning health system. 
At Stanford Healthcare, he leads the artificial intelligence and data science efforts for advancing the scientific understanding of disease, improving the practice of clinical medicine, and orchestrating the delivery of healthcare. Uh, he's the inventor on eight patents and patent applications, authored over 200 manuscripts, and has co-founded three companies. He was elected into the American College of Medical Informatics and inducted into the American Society of Clinical Investigation in 2016. So welcome. Thank you so much for coming to our conference. And All right. Are you okay? Are you okay? Do you need any slides or are you just going to speak to us? I could do either way. Um, usually at this late hour, I find making it interactive is, uh, is a Sounds lot good. more fun. Okay. So uh, I don't know how the audience is situated. Do people have the ability to, uh, you know, use a pen and paper? Or probably most people do. <laughs> so I, let's let's do this a little bit uh, in an interactive manner. Then, uh, <clears throat> uh, so I, I I am not getting any uh, visual cues. So I'm basically sort of talking into a, a, a. If you're able to turn your video on, that gives me a few visuals, uh, in the sense of whether things are tracking or not. Um, but if you have a paper, I want you to put it in portrait uh, landscape mode. And on the top border, draw an arrow going from left to right. And that is a patient timeline that we're going to fill out in a second. Okay, done. <laughs> All right. And then on that timeline, I want you to imagine a case, you know, your your own incidences, some uh, collaborator that you know, friends, family. I'm not going to ask you about it, so it's, it's going to remain completely confidential. Uh, but lay on different things that happened. Like, you know, somebody might have gotten diagnosed with a bad disease. They got some imaging studies. Like just lay out those events on the timeline, you know, five or 10 events that you can think of. And then now that we're in landscape mode on the left border of your page, which would be the beginning of the arrow. I want you to start writing the kinds of data that would have been collected for the case that you're imagining. And then put a little check mark like at that relevant position if at a certain point in time that modality would have been collected. So for example, if the modality is an MRI, and if somebody was diagnosed with, uh, with a, a tumor, at the first instance of the diagnosis, you might collect an MRI, so you put a check mark there. And then there might be a surgery, so you put a check mark under surgery or a procedure. And then three years later, there might be another MRI, and so you'll have another imaging check mark. And so imagine as many modalities as you can, prescriptions, imaging, procedures, vital sign measurements, genetic measurements, variables. Okay, I have about five people on screen. The rest are still off camera. Um, I'm going to ask one of the folks on screen to uh, sort of hold up the image that you have. Doesn't have anybody's name. There's no identifying information there. And but one or two people, if you hold it up, uh, 
All right, it's uh, the the face identifying feature of the Zoom uh, uh, software. Yeah, I, I see the one from Anita. Yes, it went in and out of focus, but I, I got a candle on it. Yep. So what you have in front of you is what I would call a patient timeline object. And now I'm going to show it on screen. So you'll have some version of this. Uh, this is a particularly uh, sort of dense case with uh, ICU stays and uh, uh, you know EKG measurements and cardiac output measurements and so on. And I, I really think that the most important thing I can share with you as you build out your data science programs is that when you think of data, Think of patient timelines. Usually when people say data, we think tables and images and text documents and whatnot. But this is the true underlying source. And it is sparse in two ways. In the sense that if you look over time, we don't collect data continuously on people. We collect something when when there's a cause or reason to collect data. And then of the modalities that you imagine along the left uh, portion of the page, we don't collect every measurement at every time. Uh, we'll collect an image once. So we might, we'll broad pressure, we might collect at every visit and height and weight we collect often. Uh, but most things are collected once, twice, maybe three times, and that's it. So if you look at any given modality, uh, over time, there's lots of holes. You, you, we have a few measurements along the way. And the reason I spend so much time on this is that the sparsity of this patient timeline object, both in terms of completeness over time. So I'm just going to pick one and, uh, sorry, go back here. I don't know what happened. like cardiac output, and you can see it's been measured four times, none of these times here, and then three times again over here. So it is sparse over time. And if we look at one stay this way, not everything is measured at one stay or one encounter. It's really important, it is sparse in both dimensions. And then we take this thing from hundreds or millions of patients and we build models. And we build models that diagnose, that prognose or make recommendations. And we make these models in the advancement of the science of medicine, the practice of medicine or the business of medicine. Usually, when it's a medical school-related effort, the default assumption is that it's about the science of medicine, and uh, you know the the pinnacle of achievement is getting published in Nature Science Cell. If you're talking to a health system clinicians, practice is sort of their main focus, and the pinnacle of achievement is being published in JAMA, Any Jam, or Lancet. And if you're here in the delivery side, you usually don't bother with publishing. Uh, you're mostly worried about Excel spreadsheets and the margins of your health system. Now, this is really important because as you think of doing data science, the thing that I see happen most often is people take an advance here in the science column assume it will advance the practice and assume that will advance delivery. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The chance that your scientific advance results in a practice advance, probably one in 50, maybe one in 100. And the chance that a practice advance results in a delivery or healthcare advance, another one in 100. So very concretely, there's elegant studies uh, that have found 
subtypes of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction uh, in, in this bucket, the one I'm highlighting. And very nice data science that shows that the disease is heterogeneous. There's three subtypes. Subtype one, you're fine for 10 years. Subtype three, you're dead in two years. It's great. It advances our fundamental understanding of the disease. Practice would advance if two more things happen, which is new patient walks in and I have a test, either an algorithm that runs on the EHR or a molecular test that sorts people into subtype one, two, three. And I have different treatments for them. Because if I don't have different treatments and I'm going to subtype them, all I'm doing is increasing the cost of care <laughs> with for no good reason. So two more things, <clears throat> I need a test and I need treatment. If I have those two things and I do it routinely for five years, 10 years in my covered population and people live longer or cost less or both, then I have advanced delivery. And if you're building a data science program, you have to be very diligent and cognizant of where are you playing. And I think we're already five minutes over, so I will pause here. Uh, there are slides about my work in these different cells, but that's not very relevant. The most useful thing to share from our learning here is that as you embark in your own work, you know, think about the patient timeline and how complete your timeline is, because that d dictates how reliable your findings are. And then are your findings, where do they land in this grid? Are you solving a classification problem? Are you solving a prediction problem? Or are you making treatment recommendations? And is the endeavor to advance the science practice or delivery? And I will stop here and we can take questions, go into the panel. Thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Shah? Go ahead. Go yes, ahead. Thank, thank you for the talk. So I'm just wondering what's the current standing of the healthcare that uses AI? So is it really like, so I'm kind of far from that actual medicine field. So um, so like EPEX or my work is on how to use the, you know, biological data to make predictions, but how medical doctors or healthcare providers are actually uh, using such, you know, scientific findings and where where are they in terms of, you know, using and interpreting AI or AI related data sets? So that varies lar hugely based on where you're based. <clears throat> At an academic medical center like ours, uh, there are 38 products with AI guidance that are routinely used by doctors. Um, different places will have different uh, uh, thresholds for how pervasive their use of AI is. It really depends on your infrastructure, I guess, to some extent, as well as the the literacy, if you will, mm -hmm. of the faculty that is providing care. Dr. Matsufara. Oh, hi. Yeah, I had a question. Um, so, you know, we often go to um, our ophthalmology and vision science, um, sorry, meetings. And at the last one, which was in May of 2023, um, there was some talk about using AI and having the FDA approve it for, um, you know, for diagnoses of eye disease. So can you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, when you said that there's a lot going on at, at your university, is this, is this at that level where, where it's being approved nationally? So there's multiple paradigms under which algorithms get approved. In the US, there are four prevailing paradigms. You can have software as a medical device, which is where the IDX, I think is the name of the company that builds this retinal scanning software um, out of University of Iowa, where uh, I think that is amongst the first software that can independently read a retinal image and charge $85 or something like that. Um, 
there's about 520 algorithms approved by the US FDA under the software as a medical device paradigm. But that's one of the many paradigms how AI can be regulated. Uh, there is the paradigm of practice management software under which Epic and other things like that fall. And that is regulated by the ONC's uh, Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT via certification paradigm. Uh, the third paradigm is uh, viewing these models that are making classifications and predictions as laboratory developed tests. And you can appeal to the CLIA paradigm under the CMS regulation. And then the fourth one is software as a therapeutic. The buzzword for that is DTX, digital therapeutics. Um, the first app to be prescribed in the US was Ginger IO, uh, evaluated by the FDA's uh, drug division and not the device division. <laughs> um, and so the clinical trial paradigm of evaluating a therapeutic in a prospective setting. So those are the four regimens under which the US sort of cobbles together its coverage of regulation of AI. And a lot of things fall under the crack, out, out between the cracks and do not have any regulatory oversight. For example, in, recently in the news is this algorithm used by United Health subsidiary called Navi Health to deny uh, coverage uh, to patients. No regulatory oversight. It is, it is not never seen by the FDA because it is not software as medical device. It is not a practice management software either. Uh, it is a regression that produces a number that is advisory to the patient advocate. But then there are policies that hold the patient advocate accountable to adhering to that output, which has led to a major ruckus, at least in the US, um, a couple of articles by Stat News uh, on it. Thank you. Thank you very yes. much. So interesting. I think what we'll do is we'll move to the panel discussion because we have some questions we'd love uh, for the panel to, to respond to. I just want to highlight uh, some other panel members that are joining. Um, Dr. Martin McEwen is uh, my colleague and a full professor and head of the Division of Neurology um, and also works at the Pacific Parkinson Research Institute as the UBC Chair of Parkinson's Research. He's also an associate member at, in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Um, his research interests include examining novel treatments for Parkinson's and exploring how engineering methods and data science can be used to enrich the lives of people with Parkinson's. And he's very well published and a leader in that space. Um, another individual is Dr. Um, Rohit Singla, who's a DASH trainee, a Vanier Scholar, MD-PhD candidate at UBC. And under the guidance of Robert, Dr. Robert Rowling and Chris Nguyen, his research has spanned quantitative kidney ultrasound, exploring scales from the macro to the micro. He recently defended his thesis, congratulations, and is now immersed in his clerkship year. Um, he's passionate about harnessing technology to enhance patient care, develop groundbreaking therapeutics and innovative medical devices. And finally, uh, Ricky, Dr. Ricky Hugh is a DASH trainee, and he's in our core internal medicine program at UBC. Nice to see you, Ricky. And prior to coming to medical school, he did an undergraduate degree in engineering physics and math and did a master's degree in biomedical engineering. And his interest is in developing new AI tools uh, to identify abnormal tissue and ultrasound. Um, he's looking for new ways to analyze medical data uh, to perform previously difficult tasks such as multimodal image analysis and prediction of uh, cardiac care events. Uh, he's also an advocate for ethical and informed use of AI and has taught the fundamentals of AI to over 300 of his uh, colleagues, medical students, uh, residents, and healthcare professionals. So we have a great panel. Uh, to respond to questions, I'm just making sure there's in the chat. So please put your questions in the chat, but I might start off with the, the overarching question is, and I, I realize in the US it's a different regulatory landscape, um, but I think we can always learn from different uh, locales. So the question that we wanted to pose to the panel is what are the barriers to realizing the full potential of AI in the context of health research. And 
can AI surpass our capabilities in understanding human well-being? So a little bit philosophical as well. So I don't know if uh, anyone wants to start off responding to that question or thought about it. I can start because I, I think I'm the one of the least experienced people <laughs> in this panel. <laughs> so um, so with that question I got uh, for the discussion, I was thinking about the privacy and the number of data sets that are quite practical issues that need to be solved. And also uh, my big question about, you know, the application of AIs in medical field is who's going to be trained in using AI and interpreting mm -hmm. AI and evaluating AI. So I think those are the things that we can consider um, as some of the issues in the field. Absolutely, I agree. Martin? So I just comment about the privacy. You know, this comes up all the time and it's an extremely important, but I think um, two technical developments that might assist with this. One has already been mentioned earlier today and that is the idea of federated learning where instead of sharing the data or pooling the data, each site can uh, maintain its data and basically share the parameters of the model. So I think that's uh, a, a great technical advance that that um, will greatly simplify uh, trying to generate um, models based on huge amounts of data. The other thing, which I again might be, um, I, I guess, application specific, but is relevant to the stuff that we do, where we're looking at, for example, uh, videos of, of, of people with movement disorders. And that's this idea of uh, edge computing. So instead of um, having to transmit uh, identifiable data over the internet, if some of the uh, data can be pre-processed at the site, and then only the uh, less identifiable features are transmitted, I think that will also mm -hmm. circumvent many of the concerns about uh, privacy. That's really cool. Thanks, Marty. But I, so I'm thinking of my, you know, brain imaging data like fMRI, MEG. We can definitely de-identify them and pre-process them to before we share them. But then it's only a single kind of a dimension of the data. So mm -hmm. you don't know the biological features of them, the personal histories. So with so once you de-identify those data that you are interested in processing, then how can you have all this integrated data for multi-dimensional? Mm -hmm. Um, machine learning. Well, what you would do is you would keep the data local and private that's identifiable. So you would trade. So let's say you you wanted to collaborate with a, another university, um, and you both had identifiable data. So what you do is you train the model on your data, and then instead of setting your data, you send the parameters of the model to the other site, and then they update it based on their local data. So everything stays private to the institution. I, I can just tell you in practice, you know, we, we were collaborating with a group in Europe and the, the uh, rules in Europe are so strict. It took three years to be able to just share uh, resting state fMRI data. Oh. I mean, it really is quite uh, onerous. And so I think this idea of, of, of um, federated learning to circumvent that, I think is going to be a, a huge benefit for mm -hmm. uh, some of the stuff that we are all doing with uh, identifiable data. Does anyone else want to speak up? Yeah, perhaps I'll add in another dimension there. Uh, <clears throat> another barrier to realizing the full potential of AI in the context of health research is literacy, really. Uh, I think Ricky, who can speak a little bit to that, but so many of the healthcare professionals we work with, whether it be uh, clinicians or allied, allied health professionals or other, uh, just aren't aware of what the differences are, what it takes or what the nuances are around AI. And of course, I applaud many of the audience members here for being interested, being willing to learn. Uh, and it's that sort of literacy barrier that will enable us to start seeking out new products, new ways to challenge the way we do things um, and provide us new insights. As far as the second question there goes, with regards to <clears throat> can AI surpass our capabilities in understanding human well-being, uh, it's like many other tools we have is yet another tool. It can really help mm -hmm. us understand complexity. Uh, it can help us understand or answer questions that we may have never thought of before, or answer questions that we didn't even know could be answered. Uh, so it may not surpass us, but I think it'll be greatly enhancing our capabilities 
um, so that we can think of a little bit more abstractly or a little bit more uh, future forward. Well, to me, one of the exciting things is um, is uh, being able to detect um, associations that we wouldn't normally thought. Like a, a kind of a funny anecdote in in neurology, at least, is uh, I remember an older geriatrician telling me, you know, I can always tell which of my patients have dementia because they're the people when I'm walking them back to the examining room when they when they start talking, they stop walking. And, you know, not, I mean, most people who deal with dementia are familiar with dual task interference and all this sort of stuff. But it's that sort of funny association between walking and talking that, you know, aren't, you know, intuitively obvious. I, to me, that's going to be the uh, some of the exciting things that we're going to see if you if you can uh, collect lots and lots of data and then come up with these um, associations that were not previously obvious. I, I think that's going to be. Uh, exciting for us. Yeah, I can speak to a bit to the literacy component. I think there's a lot of intimidation to learning AI, but there is a lot of low hanging fruit that's high yield because AI at its core is just biostatistics. Um, and, and a lot of AI algorithms, they're no different than the algorithms, the scoring systems and prediction scores that are already used, commonly used in clinical practice. A major barrier, I think, is the complexity of these algorithms, particularly with the neural networks. There are you know, hundreds of layers long, millions of parameters, and they're difficult to interpret. Um, but interpreting in a, in a very algorithmic fashion, fashion, just understanding the input, output, how it's validated, what are strengths and limitations, I think is, is actually makes great progress in using be able to use it responsibly and i don't think it takes much even you know five to ten hours of rudimentary ai biostatistics training i think can get us understanding using it in a responsible way it's like in the 90s we learned sort of critical appraisal of clinical trials randomized controlled trials it's really also learning the critical appraisal of ai algorithms and understanding you know can you apply this to your patient? What were the, you know, how, how was it developed? What population was developed? So I completely agree with you. Um, so to what extent do healthcare providers and health researchers hold the responsibility of being data and AI literate? Like how can we implement AI more broadly in medical and graduate school curriculums in Canada? I know many schools in the U.S., not all of them, but many They've started, I know in Toronto, University of Toronto, they've started it in their undergraduate curriculum. So I'd be curious to hear what your thoughts are on that. Would you be willing to drop the Krebs cycle? Um, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. You know, this. I think that's what the challenge is with all of medical schools. Like content keeps being added. Like what I learned in medical school is uh, a slice of what I think the volume of information you guys are all learning. So- yeah, I, I think that, that it's a, this is a challenge, right? Of yeah. where does so, it go I mean, in? Th this comes up across MD training, residency, fellowship. There's 181 professional subspecialty societies worldwide or US-wide. And each and every one of them has it on their website that thou shall train the trainees in data science and AI. Right. And not one of them has a plan on what are you going to displace from the curriculum to make space and how are you going to both impart and then test for those skills. So at some level, all of these calls for teaching med students and fellows and residents about AI essentially just boil down to proclamations like hollow proclamations that don't go anywhere unless we're willing to make space in the curriculum. Uh, perhaps I, I might rephrase that and say it kind of comes from powers that be. Uh, it's not that our education isn't uncredited. There is an accreditation body, and it's that body that needs to put that focus on, uh, and the decision makers there. I will also say that one work, one piece of work that we're actively doing on with my group and a group of students here uh, is defining that curriculum. What are those learning objectives? Because you're right, uh, these websites and the powers that be in certain ways say we should teach it, but no one says what. Uh, nor do I think that every medical student or a healthcare professional needs to know how to do gradient descent algorithms or write linear algebra like Ricky and myself have, have done. 
what we need to do is understand those core concepts, what's mm -hmm. applicable, the ethical dilemmas we've heard today throughout the throughout the day, and when and how to apply that, that critical appraisal step. Uh, and really come to a consensus of what are the core objectives, core learning objectives that need and should be taught mm -hmm. to the roles. Well, I would agree. I like. I think we don't need to be too literate, to be honest, in the sense that no one knows how, well, very few people know about the radon transform, the MRI scanner, how to move it from case space and all that sort of stuff. We don't need that to be able to, uh, you know, use the MRI as a clinical tool. But I do think the fundamental concepts that I think maybe Ricky was alluding to, things mm -hmm. like uh, you know, what's a feature, what, it, mm -hmm. what is discrimination, you know, uh, you know, how do you deal with prior probabilities? I think the, the fundamental concepts mm -hmm. um, wouldn't be that much to, to include. You, I don't think people need to know that every single latest transformer generative model or something like that. I mean, I, I, I do think that this, this, the broad concepts though could certainly be integrated into the curriculum fairly easily. I can speak a bit from experience. So I did medical school training at Queens and they introduced probably before my time an introductory statistics course as part of the first year curriculum. They displaced several things. I think embryology was one of the topics they displaced. Um, and to add AI to that training, I don't think it would take more than a few lectures in addition to that. In terms of how it's assessed, I do agree it's difficult. We give a test on AI subjects, then there might not be limited retention. Uh, and really for me, what consolidates is, is, is doing it as a use case example. So in the statistics course, this would be you know, journal clubs, case studies, or when you're in the ward and you're learning how to apply certain you know, treatment guidelines, what the evidence is, that sort of critical appraisal during their clerkship and their clinical rotations. I think that it really is useful consolidation. Like unfortunately, without the introduction of AI technologies into that, into the clinical workspace, the opportunities to have that consolidation is limited. So, yeah, we certainly don't have it in uh, integrated into the day to day uh, clinical life right now um, at our teaching hospitals. Um, I think that's coming, but it's not fully integrated. Um, that would be my observation. Ricky, do you, what's your observation? Yeah, I don't think it's, it, it isn't fully integrated. Uh, certainly all of is ad hoc on the fly yes. statistical <laughs> analysis when we're discussing cases, uh, yes. what's the evidence behind this certain, this certain treatment or this guideline, but nothing formal. So, Yeah. Any other comments? Thank you for sharing the, the, the resources on the chat. Uh, Rohit's sharing some great resources. So, I have one comment slightly off topic, yeah, but yeah. related, I think. And in, in, uh, one of the challenges that we've run into, of course, is if you have supervised learning, what, uh, what we're noticing is, uh, you know, a lot of the people developing this are engineers or data scientists, and they'll go to the uh, experts, the domain experts will be the clinicians and they'll say, you know, attach a label to this uh, data point. But the problem is, is the labels are noisy. And I think too often I've seen the problem where there may be interradio variability between different domain experts. And so uh, you can run into real problems where you're training models based on incorrect, noisy clinical labels. And so, uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think one has to one has to bake into the system the ability to do assume that there are error bars on the clinical labels. Bit of a offshoot, I know, but I, I think it is pertinent to real life um, application of these technologies. I think that's a very good point. Okay, so we're getting close to our uh, our time. Uh, I want to thank uh, all of you for coming and participating in our course today, and uh, I hope you got something out of it, and uh, we are getting close to the end. I'm really delighted that so many people stayed to the very end, and I'm hoping Diane is going to change up the slides. <laughs> So thank you very much for participating today. Really grateful for that. So we have two prizes that we're really delighted about and that we're going to announce. So go ahead, Diane.
So uh, the Trainee Research Award goes to Human Computer Interactions. Um, so congratulations, Ming, on Compassionate Healthcare Wizard of Oz study. So that's wonderful. Congratulations. And our runner up. Wonderful, Dahlia gets the, the runner up award, assessing reproducibility crisis in vaginal microbiome. So that's great. So congratulations to our uh, trainees. Thank you for submitting your abstracts. And it was really a pleasure to get to hear about the work that you all do. So uh, we will be sending out a survey because your feedback is important to us and it helps us define and refine our uh, educational offering. So please give frank and constructive feedback so we can continue to improve. I just wanted to let you know about our health data analytics, our UBC micro credential certificate program. And it's going to be launching in January of 2024. It's funded by the BC Ministry of Post-Secondary uh, Education and Future Skills. It was jointly developed with the UBC Data Science Institute. It's intended for healthcare professionals and administrators who wish to upskill their careers or learn how to integrate data science into their everyday practice. Um, the content is specific for the BC healthcare system. Uh, you don't need to have any prior data science knowledge or expertise, uh, that's not required. And we'll put the course link in the chat box if you're interested. Again, that's something we'll also put up on our website. And uh, very grateful that you joined us and uh, thank you so much for your time. And please provide your feedback and suggestions where this is your community too. And we welcome all of your input. And I'm going to give you three minutes back. So enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. And I look forward to connecting with you next time. Thank you.